And I would like to welcome all of you to our program this afternoon, an eco-friendly approach to growing healthy roses. I'm Suzanne Bontempo. I am the program coordinator for Our Water, Our World. And I have with me this afternoon, Lorenzo Levenger, Hello, who welcome. also is, uh, we're both IPM advocates and QUEL, uh, Qualified Water Efficient Landscapers. Uh, we both are um, QUEL certified. And he is here to assist me with the uh, Q&A and the chat. So as questions come up, uh, please go ahead and put those in the Q&A and we will, uh, Lorenzo will most likely be bowing out until the end of the program. So let's get started. So I'd just like to welcome everyone. I'm very excited to be talking about roses. I shared with everyone an email that has uh, the outline uh, for you if you'd like to take notes and then also a helpful uh, gardening resource page, okay? And throughout this program, we are going to go through slides for about 45 minutes. I have a lot of information for you, a lot of content. So um, I, it's hard for me to whittle things down because everything is important. But I'm going to first talk about, I'm just going to introduce those of you that are not familiar with the Our Water, Our World program. We're going to have an introduction. We're going to talk about integrated pest management briefly. Uh, we are going to talk about pest prevention for roses. And then we're going to review some of the common pests of roses and those management strategies, and then some additional resources. So our sponsor this afternoon is the uh, Alameda Countywide Clean Water Program. And I'd just like to start off by sharing that this is a program that protects Alameda County creeks, wetlands, and bays from runoff that may carry pollutants into the waterways. Related to gardening, that means avoiding chemicals that can be washed off into the lawn or washed off the lawn and garden into the storm drains by irrigation or rain. To learn more about the Clean Water Program, you can visit their website. You can also sign up on the newsletter to receive alerts when we will have uh, more programs such as this webinar and other events throughout the county. And for those of you that have uh, that are new to our uh, programs, you can see a library of past webinars that the Our Water, Our World Program has prepared for the Alameda Countywide Clean Water Program on the Clean Water Program YouTube channel. So we have a lot of really great uh, past webinars that are very informative and helpful so that if there are some terms or uh, if you'd like to learn a little bit more about building healthy soils or fertilizing and so forth, you can look at some of our past programming for more information that we've expanded on. And so what is the Our Water, Our World program? We are a, one moment. We are a national award-winning program that is throughout the state of California. We uh, partner with water pollution prevention agencies. Uh, they will sponsor our materials and our um, services as we work with retailers throughout the greater Bay Area and California. And we provide integrated pest management educational, uh, educational information for the public and for the retailers. We have these uh, literature racks in many of the stores that have these uh, single fact sheets that address certain topics and pest management for such topics such as ants, aphids, rats and mice and so forth. And then you might uh, actually start to see posters of our QR codes that will lead you right to those fact sheets on the website. We also take the time to tag the products that each retailer sells uh, that is eco-friendly with these little blue shelf talkers. So you might be familiar with seeing these at some of your local retailers and that's uh, what it's all about. Because we teach, um, uh, because we are designed to bring awareness between pesticides and water quality, we're always aware that runoff from landscapes can enter the storm drains and then flow out to our local creeks without being treated. So with that, we like to uh, remind folks or share with uh, folks that all the actions they take outside in their yards and throughout their gardens actually can, uh, is 
be directly linked to our waterways. So we always teach uh, less toxic strategies, those that will not be toxic to our waterways. And we do that by teaching integrated pest management or IPM. Integrated pest management is a decision-making process which we use science-based strategies. It allows us to look at the garden as a whole and start to um, ask a few questions. So we might see something that doesn't look right, for instance, maybe a yellowing of a leaf. And we want to then start asking a few questions like, what is the problem? Is this a symptom of another problem or is this uh, the immediate problem? And is it something that we can live with? And from there, we are going to learn from observation and uh, always apply preventative measures so that we can prevent pest problems from happening down the line. We always want to properly identify what the situation is so that we can resolve it. And then if we need to take uh, any type of uh, resolution actions, these are action steps. And in integrated pest management, they're called controls. Um, we go through cultural controls, which is bolstering the health of the garden and really making sure that the um, plants throughout our garden are all so healthy that if pests come in, it's not going to be an issue. We work with mechanical controls. These are the traps and barriers and tools that we might use to manage pests. We work with biological controls, which are the living organisms uh, that we use to manage pests. And you know, a lot of us are aware of like maybe beneficial insects such as ladybugs. And then um, we are also going to uh, include chemical controls, which are the pesticides, but we always uh, we'll go to these as a last resort after we've exhausted all of the other um, actions. So I'm going to start by talking about pest prevention for roses, because as far as I'm concerned, that's a big part of the picture. When we want to grow healthy roses, we're going to uh, really focus on a lot of prevention. And what does prevention look like for roses? Well, it starts by building healthy soil. And then from there, we are going to protect those root zones, protect that soil with mulch. We're going to feed our plants with organic fertilizers. When we water, we're going to water that root zone deeply. And we're going to make sure that root zone is nicely saturated, nice even watering deeply. And we're not watering again until the top few inches is dry. This is on established roses. When we are adding new roses to the garden, we will be watering a little differently until they become established. We're going to choose disease resistant roses, because, especially if we are, don't want to be bothered with those uh, black spot and rust that so many roses can get, they're prone to. We're going to provide healthy garden practices. This is maintenance throughout the garden um, and what that could look like. And then we're going to invite beneficial insects so they can take care of any of the pests that are prone to um, roses. So we're gonna start with building healthy soils because when we have healthy soil, we have healthy roses. And when we have healthy roses, we have less pest problems. And we build healthy soils with compost. So um, just to point out that soil should not be an afterthought, we really want to make sure we're constantly uh, building and growing healthy soil and we can go to the store and if we're buying bags of compost, it might be under the name of like a soil amendment or a garden compost or a planting, excuse me, planting mix. You can ask the associates at the retailer to uh, which ones are compost, but typically any type of soil amendment is a compost. Um, we will, our goal is to get uh, about 5% of that organic matter in the form of compost in the soil. So it's not a lot, but when we have that 5% organic matter, what happens is that we're able to increase the water, water infiltration into the soil. So water can now flow into the soil. Even if we've got hard clay, by getting that compost in the soil, we're going to increase water infiltration. 
We're also, by adding compost, increasing the amount of uh, the water holding capacity of that soil. And this is really important as we're moving into, sadly, another dry year. Um, but something else to understand is when we are adding compost to the soil, we're also increasing the microbiology of that soil. And when we have a really nice, healthy uh, biodiversity of microbiology, now that uh, exchange, that symbiotic relationship between the microbiology and the root system is going to be uh, healthy and they're going to be able to exchange the nutrients for uh, the carbohydrates. And then the uh, microbiology is actually able to provide the root system with the nutrients on, to that plant on an as need basis and also find water on a molecular level so that the plant root system can stay healthy and happy. It's amazing. We're going to protect the soil and protect the root zones with mulch. So when I mention this, it means adding a protective layer of uh, organic matter in the form of wood chips. Um, it can be other materials like gravel or oyster shells and such, but I prefer to use wood chips because they break down and continue to feed the soil. Now, of course, we're going to apply this mulch in accordance to CAL FIRE recommendations. So of course, beyond zone one and in um, only the planting beds of zone two and then so forth. But understand when um, soil is bare, it, is, it becomes hydrophobic. It becomes uh, unable to absorb water. So in the event we do get rain or we actually have a sprinkler on, which is not uh, always the most water wise or water efficient way, but we, what we notice is that water just runs right off. But if we've got a nice two inch layer of mulch on top, that water now is able to uh, infiltrate into that soil, which is really important. Um, we also understand that it's going to reduce uh, the water evap evaporation rate significantly. So a nice two inch layer of mulch will uh, reduce the frequency of us watering by um, at least 20%, if not more. So here's the thing, if we've got mulch on that soil, before we go to water again, we need to feel the soil to make sure it is dry. So we get our finger or a trowel or some type of water meter in there because it's always gonna look dry on top, but that mulch is really holding that uh, moisture in. And also something else, especially for those of you that live in the hotter areas of the county, nice two inch layer of mulch is going to help uh, regulate the soil temperature so the root, the root zones can stay really even. So two inches of mulch on top of the soil, four inches down, that uh, soil temperature is 10 degrees cooler than the air temperature, which is amazing. And then we want to feed with organic fertilizers. So this is really important. I know that there's um, some of us are out there using products that are um, synthetic fertilizers, you know, the products that are like 16, 16, 16, or 10, 10, 10. I really want to encourage you to um, switch to organic if you can, whenever possible. And the main reason why is that uh, organic fertilizers actually feed the microbiology, which is going to further increase the health of the soil and the health of the root systems. And um, organic fertilizers feed the plants in a more natural way. So it's going to prevent those growing spurts that synthetic fertilizers, uh, uh, we see with synthetic fertilizers. The synthetic fertilizers act a little bit like steroids and they push a lot of new growth. Well, insects we find are really attracted to that new growth because it's tender and filled with a lot of plant sugars. And then something else to understand is that organic fertilizers are not going to burn the plants. Uh, they're also not going to be toxic or get into our local waterways. And um, I was going to say one more thing, and I cannot remember right now. And typically, we're only fertilizing with the dry fertilizers. These are dry fertilizers where they look like a meal or they're uh, kind of like uh, granular uh, powder. There, I'm usually just applying these uh, at this time of the year when I'm doing my rose pruning. I can also share 
that roses love alfalfa meal. I will add alfalfa meal in equal parts to my organic rose fertilizer. So my organic rose and flower fertilizer, I will have, let's just say one cup, and then I'll have one cup of alfalfa meal. Now, alfalfa meal very well will be in an ingredient in the organic rose and flower fertilizer, but I want more because it supercharges the roses. It adds nitrogen and trace minerals to the soil, which uh, the roses really respond to. And it also, alfalfa meal, contains a natural fatty acid, which is a growth stimulant called trionconotol. Lorenzo, trionconotol. I, I can't pronounce that one. But anyway, just trust me. It's an amazing growth stimulant that really uh, the roses respond so well to. Now, I prefer the alfalfa meal over little alfalfa pellets. Uh, even though the alfalfa pellets are designed to feed um, animals, I don't know what that is, uh, the binding agent is. And I just really want to make sure I'm just using the meal and I'm working it into the top inch or two of soil around the root zone of my roses. Something else I can share is that uh, azomite. Azomite is amazing. And uh, I've just learned about this in the recent years. It is a natural mineral uh, that um, when we add it to, and I'm just doing a couple tablespoons, not uh, in addition to my fertilizing. So read the label and see what their application um, rate is on the back of the label for the azomite, but it's not gonna be as much as the fertilizer or the alfalfa meal, but it is going to provide additional nitrogen, potassium and phosphorus. But here's the thing, because it improves the root stems, the overall blooms and plant vigor, what this means directly to us rose growers is that it prevents that um, head droop. So on some of our English roses that have really large heads like Grandiflora's or the David Austin's, sometimes the stems are not strong enough and those heads are so heavy they'll droop. Well, when we add azomite to our fertilizing schedule, those heads are going to be upright and strong. So that is something else that's amazing that you might already know about. And then earthworm castings, yet another superfood for our roses. So all of these ingredients, the organic rose and flower, the alfalfa meal, the azomite, and earthworm castings, this is the foundation in addition to compost and mulch to growing healthy roses that are going to be fairly pest free throughout the year. Okay. So earthworm castings, again, maybe it's just a couple tablespoons. We're going to work it into the soil. Uh, and then we're going to, um, uh, do the final layer is that layer of mulch. Of course, mulch is not going to come up around the stem of the rose. It's going to be out a little bit from the stem, but it's going to be nice two inches protecting that soil. And let me share that earthworm castings, um, not only do they contain an abundance of nutrients and minerals essential for the roses to thrive, but they have a uh, Highly, they're highly effective at preventing insect pests and they also inhibit diseases. There are little enzymes in the earthworm castings that move through the cell uh, cells of the plant tissue and actually work as a pest prevention. It's totally cool. And then through the growing season, so I've mentioned that I use those all of the other in, uh, fertilizers and the earthworm castings I'm doing now at the time of pruning my roses. But then through the growing season, um, pretty much I'll say March through September, maybe October, I am uh, going to be fertilizing with a nice uh, quality uh, liquid fertilizer. So I am mixing this with in my watering can according to the labels instructions. And I'm going to be applying this maybe one or two times a month after I've watered my roses or the roses have been watered. And this is a really easy way to feed throughout the season. And I'm always going for something that is the fish emulsion or fish hydrolysate or a combination with fish and kelp. Because again, that kelp is going to also be a, uh, a cell growth stimulator and really stimulate a lot of healthy new growth on our plants.
Okay, so this is the ticket. And the reason why is because here is an illustration of what I was mentioning before, where we want that microorganisms in the soil, we want to encourage them, and they have this symbiotic relationship with the roots, and we want to be feeding that. We feed uh, all of that with the compost and the organic uh, fertilizers, whereas if we're working with synthetic fertilizers, those little multicolor beads, or something that might turn bright blue or bright green when we add water to it, that's strictly just feeding the plants, thus the plants become dependent on it. And if we miss a feeding, that plant becomes stressed. I can also share that the uh, synthetic fertilizers are high in salts. And if we are not watering deeply and really flushing that fertilizer through the soil, which then can leach into the waterways, which can be a problem, if we're not doing that, we are going to have a little bit of a salt buildup in the top few inches of that soil. And salt, as we know, is detrimental to the soil, detrimental to the microorganisms of the soil, and uh, will uh, soon prevent root systems from really absorbing the uh, moisture and nutrients that it needs. So I say this because we are in California and we are going to, we do experience many time, uh, periods of drought and synthetic fertilizers are really challenging for times of drought. Okay, and something else I wanna share is that roses are going to grow best with six or more hours of direct sunlight, okay? I know some of us like to push limits. Uh, there are roses out there that can handle a little bit of dappled shade in the afternoon or morning, but understand, full sun is six or more hours of direct sunlight. So uh, let's just be a little realistic about that because when we're not, if we're planting a rose in an area that isn't getting adequate sunlight, it is going to be more prone to some pest problems. And when we water, we want to make sure we are encouraging deep root systems by watering deep root systems. So remember, uh, the roots are only going to go where the water goes. So we really want to, when we're planting new ro roses, like those bare root roses right now that are out there, or if we're adding new roses to our garden throughout the year, we are going to understand that the root system is only the size that we see. But we really want to encourage root systems to grow out and down. So as the plant matures, we are going to be moving irrigation out around that drip line and we're going to be watering a little bit more uh, volume of water. We're gonna be watering a little longer, and then we're gonna be watering a little less often, less frequently as that plant becomes established. And remember, at roses, it could take anywhere from one to two, maybe three years for some roses to become established. So this is that picture of that drip line. Now, this is a illustration of a tree, but this applies to perennials, to shrubs, to roses, to just about any, um, uh, many of our plants in our garden. And you see how that green canopy, let's just imagine this is an aerial view of looking at the rose, that green is going to be the rose. We really want to uh, grow roots out and then down as well. And so then when we fertilize, we're also gonna be fertilizing at that drip line, not at the stem, not at the crown. So this is something we see a lot of. We see irrigation right at the, where the top part of the rose, the stem, uh, or you know the top branches meet the root system, that's the crown. We wanna make sure that the irrigation is actually out. So as the plants grow, because if a plant uh, has a small root system, that could very well be the appropriate place at the beginning, but as that plant grows, the roots are growing out. And so we wanna make sure we're adding irrigation emitters and we're bringing them out. We might need to add more to make sure when it, we water, it's getting even all the way around. This one's tricky for a lot of people. That's why we spend so much time talking about these concepts in all of our programs. And then we're gonna choose disease resistant varieties. Now. 
there are some roses that we absolutely love as um, I saw in the chat earlier. And some of those varieties are prone to black spot or rust. So we are going to decide uh, or just change some tolerances, have some understanding. We know who is getting rust and who is getting black spot. And we just maybe understand that that's just the characteristics of that rose. What I, well, I'll talk a little bit about black spot and rust um, in a moment. But cleaning up the garden and providing healthy garden maintenance means deadheading our roses throughout the growing season to encourage more blooms. We are going to remove any dead or damaged branches, uh, remove those diseased leaves. Now, what I mean by that is when I start to see uh, black spot or rust, I'm going to actually remove the leaves from the bottom third of my rows to open up the airflow. And also, as many of us know, when we are pruning our roses, it's nice to prune them in a way that they have an open, almost like a vase shaped uh, look to them so that they can have the maximum amount of airflow because airflow is key to preventing and reducing the pest problems such as black spot and rust. We also wanna make sure we're watering early in the day, excuse me, and that we're watering the root zone and not the plants. We really wanna avoid any overhead watering because that is also going to encourage uh, more fungal issues like black spot and rust. And then we work with barriers. So for those of us that are faced with gophers and deer, we want to make sure that the gophers and the deer are not able to uh, access, have any access to our roses. So deer fencing, gopher baskets, these are really important. Now, for those of us that are in the really hot areas like Dublin and, um, and really east, you know, Pleasanton, Livermore, even though we're in full sun and roses love full sun, there could be a point when, um, when we're in those triple digits that your roses actually might benefit from some shade. So using shade cloth accordingly, and typically we're not going to use a shade cloth that's more than 50% uh, shade. So the shade cloths, cloths, we can purchase them at 30% shade, 40%, 50%, 75%, but we're looking at really 30 or 40% would be enough. And then uh, for those of us that uh, really get a lot of snails and slugs, which is not always the case with roses, but I sure have experienced that, working with the copper tape barriers are excellent. And then working with traps. So uh, the traps can look like a homemade earwig trap, which is what's in the top left corner, or a slug and snail trap, which is boards that are on top of the uh, soil and there's a little riser underneath. And during the heat of the day, slugs and snails will caught underneath to access the moisture and the shade. Then we lift that up and we could scrape all those snails off and to, yeah, feed them to the chickens. Uh, yeah, yellow, I'm sorry, yellow sticky traps are excellent for white flies and aphids. And then of course we have uh, different types of rodent traps like gopher traps and such. But I just wanna share one more um, moment about the earwig trap, which is a plastic deli container that maybe some salsa or hummus came in. And then we put a little bit of, um, fill it maybe just halfway with some water and some a couple drops of dish detergent and a, a few drops, like maybe a tablespoon of some type of a fish oil, like from tuna or sardines or something like that. And then we put the lid back on, but the lid has little holes that I've cut out. Now, this is something that's on the UCI PM website, so it is science-based, but I will sink this in. So the lid is at the top level of the soil and the earwigs cannot resist that fish oil and they will go in there and they will drown. So last year was a big year for earwigs and the earwigs were all up in my roses and it was just, they were wreaking havoc. So I had a bunch of these out in the garden. Let me tell you, every couple of days I'd look and there'd be hundreds of earwigs in there. It was gross, but very effective. And then 
we do want to invite our beneficial insects, our pollinators and other garden allies. Okay, so a lot of these beneficial insects are in the form of the larva, the larvae form of the adult, such as the green lacewing. We're going to see him out there or the ladybug larva. We're gonna see them out there uh, devouring aphids and white fly nymphs and mealybugs and so forth. Uh, soldier beetles are also one of the first beneficial insects to emerge right when the aphids have and they're going to be out there not only pollinating the flowers, but also eating the aphids. So know that we have these allies out there and we want to encourage them. And we do that by planting a variety of flowering plants. So even um, I have my roses mixed in with perennials, but in areas where I just have roses in pots, I'm always planting alyssum at the base. It's very inexpensive at the garden center and all it all you need is one little of the six packs. You just need one little. And I love alyssum because it's got those uh, clusters of little flowers. And similar to the yarrow or ceanothus, uh, our beneficial insects are tiny. So they are really attracted to the small flowers. Something else we wanna um, plant a variety of are things that look like a daisy or a sunflower. Because again, though the petals of this daisy in this picture are white, those are actually the rays. Okay, so we're only seeing one flower, but what the insects see are the petals, which are rays that attracts them. And then that yellow button in the middle is actually hundreds of tiny little microflowers. So when we have a variety of flowers that are tiny, we're gonna have a variety of uh, tiny beneficial insects. Then we're going to make sure that pest identification is 100%, because if we can't identify the pest, it's going to be really difficult to uh, solve the problem. And then from there, we want to understand the life cycle of that pest and learn its habitat, its timing. So one really um, one easy example I like to share is spittle bugs. Every spring, typically at the end of March, we start to get questions about the spittle bugs. They are uh, like a little leaf hopper that creates what looks like spit, this little foamy mass that they put, um, they lay their eggs in there to protect the eggs. And um, really it only lasts uh, about two weeks, the whole season for the spittle bugs is about two weeks. It doesn't do anything to the plants. And if it's unsightly, we could just blast it off with water, but there's no need to do anything more. And keeping in mind that over 90% of the insects we are seeing in the garden are actually beneficial insects. So this is one of my favorites I like to share because, because I am planting alyssum at the base of my roses, which I know it is attracting, attracting the surfid fly adult. Uh, the surfid fly is an amazing pollinator, but um, its larva, which looks like this little caterpillar, uh, actually loves to prey on aphids. And when I plant alyssum at the base, that uh, surfeit fly or hoverfly adult knows, okay, not only do I have food in the form of nectar from this alyssum, but now these roses that have some aphids are going to be enough food for my, uh, my, my offspray, my, uh, my larvae. So when a lot of times at sundown, we can go out and inspect our roses and we'll see the serpent fly larvae out there actively uh, enjoying some aphids as a feast. But the reason why I bring this up is because it's so easy to see this and think this is a pest and just get rid of it straight away when this is actually our friend. And when we're working with eco-friendly uh, pesticides, of course, we're always using these as a last resort we're going to, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the modes of action in a moment, but something I like to share as a side note is that pesticides don't always solve the pest problem. Oftentimes they're just killing the pest and along with it, beneficial insects if they're present. So keeping in mind that until we can address the problem, we're not solving the problem and pesticides sometimes are just a temporary fix. So I, I created this chart where it's really important when we're working with eco front, well, when we're working with pesticides, we really kind of want to understand what is the damage of the insect. So we have insects that have uh, sucking or rasping mouth parts. That uh, sucking mouth parts would include aphids, leafhoppers, white fly nymphs, 
scale insects, mealybugs. And then plants with rasping mouth parts would be thrips and spider mites. And I'll explain why I broke this down in a moment. Insects with chewing mouth parts can be um, caterpillars, but more uh, importantly for roses, what we see are beetles and weevils, uh, leaf miners, um, borers, rose slugs, um, snails, earwigs, okay? And then crawling insects we have out of those could be um, beetles, weevils, earwigs, snails. And the reason why I break this out, because it's gonna help us figure out how we would uh, find a strategy to manage these. So let's go back to those, uh, the aphids, the sucking rasping, rasping mouth parts category, where we have the aphids and the white flies and such. Well, we can wipe off those insects. We can syringe with water, um, oftentimes just with a little handheld pressure, um, uh, to, you know, uh, um, you know, sprayer, pressure sprayer. Uh, we can syringe, blast them off with water or use a hose, even though we wanna be very careful with our water usage. We wanna invite beneficial insects in because that's easy. Uh, having some tolerance, having some uh, pest insects around will be really helpful because that's food for the beneficials. So having, you know, changing our tolerance a little bit. Avoiding synthetic fertilizers, as I mentioned before, because it's going to stimulate a lot of new growth and make the plant more prone to pests. We want to increase that air circulation. That's really important, especially with the spider mites. We're going to make sure we're irrigating properly. And I'll talk a little bit more about what, what I mean by that when it comes to our white flies, our spider mites, and our um, different diseases. And then if we do need to go for a pesticide, we can go for insecticidal soap. It's going to be one of the least toxic. It's fairly uh, narrow range, which means it only has a narrow list of insects it's going to kill, um, as well as oils, such as horticulture oil. However, what we wanna make sure is because if we're using insecticidal soap, and this is not dish detergent, okay? That's something else that's not advisable. But insecticidal soap, we are going to actually make sure we've coated that insect really well, and we're going to reapply according to the label instructions. Now, chewing insects, those chewing insects are those ones that are going to be chewing pieces of leaves or pieces of the rose petals. We can remove them by hand, really easy to remove the weevils and beetles by hand and drop them into a little bucket of uh, soapy water. And then now this is the dish detergent. So we're putting a couple drops of dish detergent into a little bucket of water and we're just dropping them in. We're gonna work with barriers and traps. Sticky traps and barriers are excellent for uh, many of these insects. Um, beneficial nematodes. Okay, this is kind of weird, but understand that many of the beetles and weevils will, their larva will uh, spend some time in the soil at some point or their larva overwinters in the soil. So if we've inoculated the soil around those roses with beneficial nematodes, then they're going to eat the larva and break the life cycle. So we're going to see less beetles or weevils. For that you'll have to make sure we're referencing the UCIPM or ask your local garden center for um, that to make sure we're, we're using them properly. And then BT, which is a narrow range um, pesticide that's a uh, beneficial bacteria is going to be for chewing insects such as caterpillars that are pests. Spinosad is a um, fermented bacteria that is also needs to be ingested. Uh, very common um, products by the name of like Captain Jack's, uh, that's Spinosad. However, Spinosad on the label, it will say we only get to use it six times a year. So we really want to be very strategic about the way we use it. Um, iron phosphate, this is going to be in the form of like snail and slug bait. Crawling insects, we can remove them by hand. We can work with barriers because they're crawling. We can work with traps like sticky traps or with those, you know, like the earwig trap that I had. Um, and diatomaceous earth is also really great because as they crawl, they get the diatomaceous earth on them, which is very fine chalk like substance. And then it dehydrates those crawling insects. So I just wanted to share a little bit that there's a lot of options uh, before we even go to a pesticide. And above all, 
we want to make sure we avoid any products containing neonicotinoids. Neonics. Neonics, some of the common ones we see um, on the shelves are going to be have these active ingredients. Probably the most familiar is the imidacolprid. Now, these neonics can come in a couple of forms where it is a soil drench where we are, the instructions are to mix it with a watering can with some water and water it in around that root zone or spray it on to the plant and it, they're going to absorb into the plant tissue and uh, work a little bit like an antibiotic does where it really goes through the entire plant, all of the cells of that plant. Well, what happens is, is that when we have uh, pollinators or beneficial insects coming to visit that plant, they are going to be um, they are going to be accessing this pesticide as well, and it will also impact them by killing them off. Or if um, beneficial insects come and they're eating the insects that have eaten uh, some of this pesticide, it's going to impact them. Or understand a lot of the adults of our beneficial insects. Uh, not only do they go for the protein meal of an insect, but they're also going for a nectar feeding. And that nectar and pollen of the flowers will also have this in um, this pesticide in it, which will um, kill them off. Something else to keep in mind, what we're learning is that uh, this these products move very freely through the soil. And if we've got, uh, if we've treated a plant, uh, let's say our rose, it's going to move through the root systems. If the root systems of our rose have expanded beyond what we could imagine, it's going to, those root systems are going to be woven together with other uh, roots of other plants, uh, maybe in a, um, you know, a meadow or somewhere else where we've got a lot of flowering plants. Those plants are now going to absorb the systemic pesticide and it's going to actually impact those beneficial insects and those pollinators. So, uh, and then just to mention, we are seeing this as a water quality issue. This is a product that we would like to avoid using at all costs because it is um, now coming, being found in our waterways. So just a heads up, please avoid these products. And then when we do use pesticides, we're going to use them as a last resort when we've exhausted all the other options. We're always going to use less toxic and eco-friendly. We're going to understand that um, less toxic products could take a little longer. So understand that mode of action. So that's a little bit why I shared those other slides with you is to understand, is it a contact kill or is it something that they're going to ingest? It could take a little time for them to die. We're always going to apply the pesticide according to the label, more is not better. We're gonna understand our unintended consequences of our actions and we're gonna take advantage of the dormant season. So a lot of our roses are breaking dormancy right now, but if we do have excessive black spot and rust or excessive aphids, let's take advantage of um, uh, a dormant application of a uh, horticulture oil or copper during the dormant season. We also want to know what the targeted pest is. We wanna know uh, what that pest is and only target that pest. We're not going to spray down the entire garden, okay? We're always applying at sundown when beneficial insects are less active. We're going to avoid applying pesticides to plants in bloom. And we're always going to wear our PPE when handling pesticides, even eco-friendlies, because I've heard people that have had dermal reactions to using neem and insecticidal soap. So long sleeves, non-cotton gloves, pants. We're not out there in short shorts and flip-flops and tank tops, okay, guys? And if we are releasing beneficial insects, let's give them a little time to take care of that food, take care of those aphids before we apply a pesticide. So in the last couple minutes, I just want to run through some of the common pests and how what management strategies might look like. So aphids, probably the number one most common pest, they're going to increase with the use of synthetic fertilizers and excessive pruning. Now we are going to deadhead our roses. Um, excessive pruning might look a little bit more like if we're hedging things back a lot. Uh, if we see ants climbing up the stems of our roses or other plants, those are an indicator that we might have some aphids or some other uh, insect that might be uh, secreting honeydew, which the ants like to farm. So we want to, that they're actually letting us know that there's a pest problem we need to um, address. And then also lack of predators. So this is the big one. 
So when we can have nice balance, a nice healthy ecosystem, we're going to have beneficial insects taking care of these aphids. However, if you have an ecosystem that you feel like is very diverse and there's a lot of plants out there that are going to attract beneficials, but we still have aphids, Heck, go ahead and just wipe off those aphids with your fingers, but inspect those roses first to make sure there's no uh, larvae of beneficial insects because they're really hard to see. But really just wiping them off is going to do the trick. White flies. White flies can be um, uh, a sign of overwatering or poor drainage. White flies have a tendency to come around when those temperatures get warm. And guess what happens when the temperatures start to get warm and dry? We have a tendency to want to water more often. Now. Again, remember how I said we have that nice layer of mulch on top? We really want to check the soil to make sure the soil has dried out because if we're just thinking that the plants need more water and we're watering more, well, guess what? This happened to me last year. I One of my roses got some white flies and I was like, oh, I know what's going on. I'm overwatering because I'm not checking to make sure that that soil is draining well. So we want to make sure that those established roses have dried out, that soil has dried out a few inches before we water again, because we could be inviting pests like white flies. But they also can increase with synthetic fertilizers and lack of predators. Uh, flower thrips, these are kind of a bummer. Um, but again, we want to make sure our irrigation is correct. This, they are very common. They will show up when we're over watering or when we've um, added a new irrigation system to favor the lawn and we have a whole bank of roses um, that's near the lawn. Now we're watering a lot more often than we used to. Uh, so just keep that in mind. And again, working with synthetic fertilizers and lack of predators are also going to breed a lot of thrips. Spider mites poor air circulation. Okay, so we really want to make sure we've got some good air circulation that we're not feeding with synthetic fertilizers. There's a theme here, but understand this is something that's really strange. When we use broad spectrum pesticides too often, um, and we've seen that a lot with uh, some of the synthetic chemical pesticides, uh, but it also we're seeing it with neem. If we're using it too much, what happens is, is the spider mites know that they're under attack and they actually all of a sudden start to breed more. So, um, and then if we're using these pesticides too often, we know we're killing off beneficial insects too. So that's just something to keep in mind. Rose slugs or soft flies, also very common. We can literally, the first moment I start to see these out there, I'm actually just removing them. I'll put some gloves on and I just wipe them right off and I inspect the leaves front and back. Not always easy to see, um, but if we can get ahead of that, we are actually killing them before they can reproduce. So they will emerge as a fly and lay more eggs and then we have another life cycle. So keep on top of these guys. Weevils and beetles, uh, beetles and weevils, as I mentioned, we can just knock them off into a little bucket of soapy water. We want to monitor. Um, and then black spot and rust, as I mentioned before, we want to uh, remove the leaves at first sight, no overhead watering, um, prune in a way to increase air circulation, remove the leaves of the bottom third of the plant. And we're going to know that some varieties, like my David Austin, just always gets black spot and rust. Well, I know that my other roses in that area are not going to get black spot and rust because they're disease resistant or resilient. And you know what? I really just love bringing, cutting. Uh, I The David Austin I grow is a cutting flower. I'm defoliating it anyway. I'm removing those leaves before I bring it in. So it's not a big loss. So that's what I mean about adjusting our tolerance. And then powdery mildew. Uh, powdery mildew, actually, we start to see it when the temperatures get warm. I wouldn't be surprised if powdery mildew is going to start to pick up now since we've had these beautiful 75, 80 degree days. Can't believe it. Um, so understand something else to keep in mind when we've got powdery mildew and black spot and rust, any leaves that have fallen to the ground, we also want to pick those up and get them out into the green waste bin. We want to remove any as many of the fungal spores as possible. Now, unlike black spot and rust, 
uh, powdery mildew uh, thrives in dry conditions. So we will start to see it when things are dry and we can actually hose off the plants uh, with water to break those spores. But we wanna make sure we've gotten both sides of the leaf and that's the tricky part. Um, understand the spores can blow in the wind. So just monitoring and removing the uh, leaves that are really highly affected and you know trying to wash it off. But for um, black spot rust and powdery mildew, you can also use eco-friendly um, products just like a uh, garden fungicide that has that sulfur as an active ingredient or uh, a copper soap fungicide. So both of those are readily available on the market, but make sure we're spraying both the top and the underneath of the leaves. And something to share, if your roses are emerging like this, hopefully they're not, but this is herbicide damage. And this is very common. We see it a lot in the spring. Uh, folks will come into the garden centers and they're like, what's going on with my rose? It's got some virus. No, sadly, you or a neighbor um, did a spraying of weeds with glyphosate or maybe 2,4-D drifted over on your dormant roses. As those roses emerge, they look like this. So it's really important to avoid using um, these types of products because of the unintended consequences. All right, so some online resources. We have the Our Water, Our World website. Uh, please check that out. And then for all of, um, you know, the UCIPM has a really nice list of pests of roses and some really great solutions for managing those pests. Uh, that's also going to help us process of elimination. If you're not really sure what's going on with your roses, if we go to the UCIPM website and we look roses up and we see all the pests that uh, roses can get, both insects and diseases, if we're not seeing it, then it could be something else or it can help us identify, oh yes, that is a rose slug or that is, um, you know, um, an aphid. But uh, I also wanted to share that we have, if we're looking for eco-friendly pesticides, OMRI, the Organic Materials Review Institute is a great resource. And also the National Pesticide Information Center. Both of these or all of these are going to be on that um, handout I emailed to you earlier today. Um, but the National Pesticide Information Center is pretty great because it talks again about those modes of action. So again, um, if I went through those products a little too fast, we can, um, look up the active ingredient of any product that you have at home and understand what its intended use is. With that, I'd like to thank you for joining us and I can take your questions for the rest of this, but I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.